PFA, which is the Bachelor of from IU, and MA from Purdue. She is an art educator. Uh, she's a uh, high school teacher at Hebron High School at the present time. I have come to know Bonnie very well. Uh, she is a member of the board of the Prairie Arts Council, and she is our program chair. So a lot of the programs you see that the Prairie Arts Council put on, puts on uh, due to Bonnie's hard work and creativity. She's also an accomplished artist of her own, working in many media, <coughs> primarily basketry, and she makes some outlandish baskets and some really interesting baskets, uh, all kinds of things. So um, with that, Bonnie. Thank you, Bob. And I just happened to find the tights at TJ Maxx. I just happened to. <laughs> what can you do? You might introduce Hillary. Oh yes, and my very good friend Hillary Eddy, who is going to be part two of this act tonight, is in the back. Glad you're here, <laughs> nice here you. Hillary. Um, if you haven't been upstairs to see her show, are you in for a treat? Um, I'm glad I get to go first. <laughs> So, they've asked me here to talk about one of my favorite things tonight, which is art. Uh, it's kind of, a, kind of a dangerous subject because everybody seems to have an opinion of what it is and they're all uh, probably different than the guy sitting next to you. But when I say art, what do you think of? What, what, what do you conjure up in your mind? Georgia, when I say art. Something that excites me when I see it. Okay. Any other thoughts? Beauty. Something beautiful. All right. Um, Probably many of you thought of paintings hanging in a gallery, maybe some sculptures in a plaza in Rome. Uh, and if you did, um, you were right. Uh, you may think of those hanging in a gallery or a museum. That's right, too. But art is so much more than paintings and sculpture. Um, as I mentioned, it's a unique subject because that term encompasses so many different things. When we say art, it includes dance, theater, music, all the performance arts. Uh, poetry, literature, and the other literary arts. But of course, tonight our focus is going to be visual arts. Um, and that encompasses, as you'll see in my lecture tonight, a very broad range of things. Painting, drawing, sculpture, photography, weaving, ceramics, glass, uh, that broad term called mixed media. I mean, just if we narrow in visual art, oh my gosh, it's such a huge topic. Um, and within each of those various disciplines is, of course, this broad continuum of what fits in as art. Uh, the thing I think is so interesting about art is there's, there's really no clear definition. Even today, we can't say art is and rattle off a clear definition. <coughs> um, or if there is a definition, give it 10 years and it'll change. Um, of the time of the ancient Greeks, Plato stated in the Republic that art should mirror the beauty of reality and nature. And so for a while, the Greeks had a handle on what they thought was art. Um, they sought to create sculptures and paintings uh, portraying natural beauty, but they took it a step further. Their goal was ideal beauty. If you ever saw a Greek sculpture, nobody ever looked like that. There's no such being. That's why they call it the Greek God, because it was this ideal, but it wasn't really an imitation of reality or nature. Uh, over the centuries, uh, art evolved and changed and served many different purposes. Uh, and then we roll around again to the time of the Renaissance in 15th, 16th century Europe. Um, they thought the Greeks had a pretty good idea, and so they decided it would be a good idea to use their uh, <coughs> standards for what is art. Um, and they were very interested in returning to those classical ideals of ancient Greece. Um, during that time, some pretty interesting things happened. There were uh, wealthy <coughs> merchants, royalty and churches started commissioning artists to do great works of art. Now we know why, it was to make them more powerful and to glorify God, supposedly. Uh, I got to go to Rome this past spring and go in St. Peter's Basilica and it was absolutely the most amazing experience. <coughs> experience. I, I can't tell you how moving it was, but when I stood back and thought, hmm, all this just for the glory of God, pretty fancy place. Um, and not that that isn't deserving, but it seemed like maybe there was a little bit of prestige in there for the uh, guy who commissioned the work and things like that. Anyway, in that time period, though, technical skill and realism prevailed. That was the norm. That was the standard. As I mentioned, ideal ideas about art and beauty, uh, what subjects and media were appropriate as great art, were clearly established at that time. 
Um, and it was possible within this patronage system for art and artists to flourish. Um, you know, if Michelangelo and Leonardo had been born at any other century, they would probably have been great artists. But the fact that there were all these millions of dollars being pumped into artists and creating art, it just it created a time like no other where the arts could flourish. Um, just to give you a little bit of focus and organization, one of my really good art appreciation texts um, does a pretty good job of breaking art into simple parts. And they state that there are four basic functions that artists perform. All you note takers, you want to get these four basic functions. Um, because these were certainly the functions that were performed by Leonardo and Michelangelo. Number one function is to record. Think of before a camera was invented, if there weren't artists recording the world around them, what people looked like, how they dressed, what their world was like, you would have no idea about what things were. So I think we owe a great debt to those earlier artists for saving their culture for us through their artwork. The second function that artists perform is to make the uh, unknown tangible. Think about all the wonderful religious paintings where they present to us the intangible, never before seen, they give us a vision of what that looks like. So, uh, giving a tangible form to the unknown. Thirdly, they give form to feelings. They have a, a, an emotion about a particular subject, and so they give it form in their art. And fourthly, of course, they show us their unique visions. So it'll be kind of fun to see what some of the different art that I show you tonight, where they plug into those categories. Now, of course, just when you think you've got it all neatly boxed up and tidy and filed away, somebody comes along and changes it. So whenever you try to get art all tidy like that, it never really totally works. So keep that in mind, too. Um, what I think is kind of interesting is that many people today still hold Renaissance ideals as their hallmark of what good art is. Did the, the reporter from the Republican come tonight? Where is he? He's supposed to come. Um, and those people, when they go to an art museum and they see a beautiful old master hanging next to a splattered canvas, they're kind of baffled as to how the heck that splattered up thing got next to this fabulous old master. Um, so, hmm. What changed? What changed and why? How, how is it that this splattered canvas can be hanging next to an old master? Well, I kind of dug in as deep as I could, and I found a couple of reasons that you guys might buy. I'm not sure. Um, first and foremost, I think, is probably the invention of the uh, camera and photographs in the, oh, about 1830s or so. When the camera was invented, boom, we had this machine that could show us our world exactly as it appears. Hmm. So, artists who had been trying to copy the real world uh, as realistically as they possibly could, um, then were compelled to even compete and do greater works with the camera. However, as the 19th century wore on, some artists began to wonder, wait a minute, why do we need to do this? We've got a camera. Why should I do it? Um, and so they started thinking, hmm, well, after all, a painting isn't the real world. A painting is pigment on a surface. A painting is, first and foremost, a painting or an illusion of the real world. Hmm, so why couldn't we try some different things with that pigment on that surface? And so this led to the development of what we call abstract art, where the artist takes images and rather than try to camera-like reproduce it on a surface, alters it for their own intentions or their own purposes. Um, for example, the Impressionist, one of the great, great early modern movements. The Impressionists were very interested in light and color and the way outdoor objects and surfaces reflected light and color. And so when they would make a painting with all those little dots and dabs and strokes of color, next to color, next to color, they weren't interested in trying to imitate what reality looked like through the lens of a camera. They were interested in using the way reality reflected light and color to generate an illusionary image of their own. So they were abstracting the paint for their own expressive purposes. A second factor that we think maybe led to change and ab abstraction in art was the, the decline of the patronage system and the um, existence of art dealers. There was a, a number of other things that went on that made artists start creating works that were not such great, huge, commissioned works. But art dealers came around and started selling uncommissioned work. A painter, like an impressionist, would go out and make a painting of something that moved them personally, give it to an art dealer, and they would sell it to someone who was interested in it. 
So this also began to allow the artist to have more freedom to paint what they wanted and how they wanted to paint it, and not have to worry about pleasing a patron. Now, modern art movements, as we call them, uh, began to form as artists started experimenting with new styles and techniques, um, looking at new ways to represent their world. Another kind of fun thing is paint in tubes got invented. Before then, the artists had to laboriously grind all their pigments back in the studio, and it was quite a complicated process. Well, somebody invented paint in a tube, and so they could pack up their paints, go outdoors, and actually paint out of doors. And so that gener generated many more spontaneous images than had been possible before. The other thing is artists would get together and talk to other artists who had similar interests. The Impressionists didn't all say, OK, let's have a club and let's be the Impressionists. They happened to be some painters who were painting at the same time who found themselves, oh, gee, hi, Monet. Hey, Renoir, how's it going? Um, you know, and they just sort of naturally gravitated together as they found that they had common interests. So um, it's not like a real formal club. Or, or, as in also the case of the Impressionists, they were some rejected artists who didn't get into the fancy salon show that the <coughs> Royal Academy dictated that only noble things painted in such and such a way could get in. Well, they were experimenting with new things and tried to enter their paintings, and of course they got laughed right out of the show. And so they had a little show called The Salon of the Refused. And uh, there was a painting in there called Impression Sunrise by Monet. And some critic, oh, look at this. Yeah, these guys are the Impressionists. <laughs> it was a joke. It was, it was a criticism. It was making fun of the way they dot, dabbed, and dotted paint on the canvas. Well, of course, it's hard for us to think of that today because, you know, we love the Impressionists. So many, just even your average, average ordinary person who has maybe no art background can find great beauty in an Impressionist painting, but they're very, very abstract. If you compare them to the real world, they're, they're quite different than a photograph of the real world. The last half of the 19th century, though, with the Impressionists and the, a group called the Post-Impressionists, which is meaning they came after Impressionism, you get some little different things, laid the groundwork for 20th century art. And we know that artists respond to their world around them. And, I mean, you all know what happened in the 20th century with everything, technology, everything out there just exploded. And art was certainly no different. In fact, art was one of the vanguard. It was the, the leader in change and innovation. Um, so, anyway, art changed at a frenzied rate just like everything else in the 20th century. Um, but let's return for a minute to you and your ideas about art. Uh, I want you to keep in mind that when we think and talk about art, that we have to remember that art is about people. It's about artists who make art. It's about visitors like yourself who visit museums and galleries and art fairs. It's about teachers like me who talk about art and talk and talk <laughs> and lead students in making art. Um, it's about my students who study art and create art. Uh, it's just about everybody who opens up their eyes and takes in visual images and enjoys them. It involves seeing. Uh, it does involve sometimes a special kind of seeing. Um, but if you have a little insight into how to see art, it can, it can fill you with wonder, amazement, disgust at times. Uh, Frank Fisher, I was talking to Frank Fisher at Hillary's opening the other night, and he was asking me about my lecture. And, and he came up to me and he said, well, wh what do you tell people when they ask you, why should I look at this art? Why, do I, why should I care about this? And so I thought long and hard about it, and I realized my response to that would be a very personal one. Um, I just know how much I discover every time I take the time to look really, really closely at a work of art. Um, it's just like putting on glasses and seeing a totally different new world. Um, and so I guess what I would say to you is if you take the time to look through the artist eyes, that is, look closely at what they've presented to you, you can expand your world completely. Um, it's just like living your life twice as fully as you would if you'd only looked through your own narrow tunnel vision. So, um, and I just can't imagine anybody not wanting to see as much as they possibly could in their short lifetime. So, all right, let's do something for fun. Let's take an art test. Now, I was going to have you guys all get out a pencil and paper. Maybe you can do it on your fingers. I'm going to have a test of <laughs> ten visual images. And if you want to, you can like, put your fingers down. And if you, come to, if, if you come to a slide that you think isn't art, <coughs> you can let your finger up if you want to or something. Or you keep a score. I don't care. It's not real serious that you have a scorecard. But let's take a test and see 
how good you are at recognizing, pardon me, recognizing works of art. Okay? All right, let's try. But no cheating. <laughs> All right, I apologize for my, my kind of puny screen with the wrinkled corners, but that's what we have. So. Okay, slide number one. If you can't see, and I tend to try to jump around, as you might have noticed, and so if I jump in your line of vision, lean over or just give me a little, and I'll try to get out of the way. Okay, slide number one. Is it art? Yes or no? Please, don't share your answer. <laughs> Slide number two. Little art in the dark is my art history. Do you like to call it? Is it art? No. Keep your answers to yourself. Slide number three. Is it art? Slide number four. Is it art? Number five. Is it on? It's cold. Shh. <laughs> Is it on? What is it? It's a it's a coastline with some fabric draped over it. Not a painting. Real. Yes, it's a real thing. It's not a painting. <coughs> Okay, this is a little bit hard to see because this is a photograph taken out of a book. Basically what you see here is there's a guy underneath a blanket with a cane and there's a lot of coyote walking around and some other stuff on the floor. <laughs> is it art? <laughs> what number was the last one? I don't know. <laughs> I think it's number seven. I think this is number eight. Okay. I was getting picked up about a hundred months ago. Okay, this is actually something that sticks off the wall. This is three dimensional. Well, kind of. Okay, number nine. This has kind of a bad focus on me. Crystal. Number nine. Let's Okay, and. Number 10, is it art? <laughs> is it alive? No, it is not alive. <laughs> but it was a darn good text. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's switch back and let's grade our tests. Okay, I gotta get my All right. What I'll do is I'll just go through and I'll just tell you if it's art and what kind it is, and you can kind of discredit yourself. If you get 10, that's 100%. If you get 9, that's 90%. That's an A minus. If you get 80, that's a B minus. 70, C minus. 60, D. 50. <laughs> All right. Is it art? Yes. Yes, it is. Beautiful oil painting done by Thomas Cole called the Oxbow, done in like the 1830s. Um, he was part of a group of painters, but we'll talk about that later. Slide number two. Can you tell us yes. where those yes. are? Yes. 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 It's a painting on a cave wall by Ice Age people who used to live in France. Done about 17,000 years ago. Wow. Number three. Yes. 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 This is a pouch made by the Plains Indian with dyed porcupine quilts decorating mm -hmm. the surface. <coughs> yes. 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 Get out of here. Why? <laughs> Actually, it is. It's an acrylic painting. And its dimensions are, it's big. It's like, oh gosh, four feet by 13 feet. It's monstrous. Who's the artist? This is Roy Lichtenstein, I'll tell you that. But this is hanging in a museum somewhere as art. Is it art? Yes. Those of you who are familiar with contemporary ceramics, this is made of clay. It's made by an artist named Marilyn Levine, and I'll talk about her a little bit more, but this is a clay, hand-built clay briefcase with mixed media. It does have metal, little metal latches for the handle, but it is ceramic clay. Yes. Is it art? Yeah. Well, you might not think it is personally, but <coughs> it is considered art. This is um, 
environmental art by the artist named Christo, who does all wraps everything from buildings to coastlines to, to islands in this Cape Bay, Florida. We'll talk about that some more too. Is it art? Yes. <laughs> I may say, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> this is a type of performance art, which is one of those crazier modern things that's been going on since about the 1960s. Um, this is a guy named Joseph Boyce, who's a German performance artist, locked himself up in a gallery for a week in New York City with a coyote, and I'll tell you why in a moment. <laughs> yes. 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 I love this piece. This is called Essex. <coughs> which is, if you know, the Essex is a car that is no longer made. And we're not sure if there are any Essex cars in this one, actually. But this is crush, crushed automobiles <laughs> welded together into a relief sculpture. <laughs> yes. And yes, of course, you've seen Joseph Albers, he's a famous colorist. We'll talk some more about that. It's an acrylic or an oil painting, about 44 by 44 inches. I'll give you dimensions and all that in a bit. <laughs> yes. Is it art? Whoa. Yes, it is. It's in a museum by the, the artist Robert Rauschenberg, who made some leaps and bounds in, in modern art movements and style. All right, here's what I want to do. I'm going to back up. This is going to be a little trickier because it's kind of dark. And I'm probably better off if I go back up to my podium. So I'm going to have my former student and dear friend, George McKim, do my slide flipper. The top one. And you might have to hop up here. This, this thing doesn't focus very well. You almost have to oh. manually like run the... Um, Lens in and out, but anyway, All right, let me get organized here. So, hmm, um, were you surprised by any of the works? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, disgusted, maybe? Oh, no. um, probably you were surprised. <laughs> probably you're surprised at the range of forms and materials. You couldn't not be surprised by that. Um, okay, let's have slide one. Now, I'm sure everyone said yes to slide one. I mean, this is what was I can't see. It is a question. Um, this, as I mentioned, is a, a beautiful painting done by the artist Thomas Cole, famous American artist of the Hudson River School. There were a group of artists in the um, earlier 19th century <laughs> devoted to capturing the beauty of the Hudson River area. Um, we love it. We recognize it. Um, its beautiful style is what we would call representational and realistic. We recognize it as a real scene. Uh, we love its form. Look how he's used lines and shapes and colors to arrange it into a beautiful composition. Um, subject matter, we can all relate to the beauty of nature. So it's pretty accessible. It's pretty easy on the eyes. It's a beautiful piece. Slide two, please. Now, probably everybody answered yes to this one, too. Um, as I said, it's a cave painting done directly on the walls uh, by Ice Age people. And even though we've never seen this in a museum, we've never been there to see the real thing, um, it's been so widely reproduced in books, and I'm sure we've all seen it somewhere or another. Um, this ancient art was, wasn't discovered until the early 20th century. It's so amazing. I heard a story or read in one book that it was discovered initially by a dad and his little boy were out walking around, and the little boy had his dog along, and the dog took off and ran back in a cave. And the little boy ran after it, and so the dad went to get him, and there was just enough light coming in that they noticed that there were some images on the walls. And upon closer investigation, my word, <laughs> they discovered 17,000-year-old uh, cave paintings. And we're very lucky that that was brought to our attention by art historians. Um, there are lots of theories about how they did these things. Now, we do, we do know that they made their pigments from the natural materials around them. They used gypsum to make whites, iron oxide for browns and yellows, charcoal for black, and then they mixed this with animal fat or blood to create pigments that they would then paint onto the walls with um, perhaps the tail of animals or they thought maybe sticks that had been sort of crushed or frayed out at the ends. And if you think about the technology they had, and some of these are way up high on ceilings, like 15 feet up in the air. I know in Altamira, there's a hall of bulls. There's one bull that the image is 20 feet long <coughs> itself. And so when we think about this, the poor working conditions, I mean, they had to have torches or fires or something in there. Um, it's amazing that they could paint them at all, let alone the ability that they had here to capture the forms. I mean, if you look at the natural coloration, the detail, even the movement. Look at how they've got their legs up in the air and they're moving. Um, some of the cave paintings even have modeling. They use shading to show the volume or the roundness of it. Absolutely astounding. 
feelings and their creative impulse is absolutely astounding. Why did they do this? Um, what was the purpose of painting? And some of them were in real little cramped spaces, totally inaccessible. Um, we don't really know for sure. Many scientists believe that it was for magical purposes. They felt that perhaps when they painted this image, that it empowered them as hunters, perhaps allowing them to have a good hunt and continue to survive. Um, possibly the cave was a temple or a sanctuary. Why did they do it? No one really knows for sure, but it's exciting that we know about it, and it's exciting that we can see it. Slide this. Uh, number three, uh, probably you said yes for this one, maybe not. Uh, it's not a painting, it's not a sculpture, but objects like this one are often found in museums today, especially if they're old or from tribal cultures. Um, as I said, this is a quill work pouch by Plains Indians. They would take porcupine quills and flatten them by biting or chewing on them. Um, they would then be wrapped, actually they used to dye them when natural dyes, but after they had contact with Westerners, they moved to synthetic dyes. But they would use uh, strips of buffalo hide and wrap the quills around it and then hook those together. Um, eventually the, the quills <coughs> gave way to glass beads that were easier to work with and prettier colors, supposedly, but the, the old ones who cherished the art form thought the beads looked dead. Anyway, you'll see many items like this in other cultures viewed as art today in art museums. If you go to um, Indianapolis Museum, you go to the Art Institute, they all have um, a cultural section. Now, a uh, hundred years ago, you wouldn't have found these objects in a museum. Again, Americans and Europeans had a very no narrow idea of what art should be. That Renaissance ideology still prevailed, and usually only paintings, only sculpture, and certain architecture were considered true art. Um, it had to be from Western civilization, it had to be based on the styles that were popular. Usually it was created by men. Um, but now, of course, the idea of art is so much broader, including so many different objects from anywhere, any culture, any time in history. Um, in fact, if something really, really old or um, from another culture, it's got a real good chance of getting put in a museum <laughs> in this day and age. So, um, can, can you imagine 2,000 years from now, the people digging up, so digging into rubble and finding something from our culture, though? Barbie imagine dolls. If, uh, Barbie dolls. Oh, that's oh. great. I was trying to think of a really good example. I was thinking of a TV remote. We've all got at least two. What do you think they think? Do you think they would think that it was art? It depends on what their perspective is. Um, they might not even find it interesting enough to say, let alone call it art and put it in a museum. But anyway, okay, let's go on with the test. Um, the next slides you see, four through 10, are all from our contemporary culture. They're all from our time and our place. Um, and that's gonna be the focus, basically, of my talk, so. And you probably have, uh, recognize the um, Albers as an abstract work. Actually, people use the term abstract in a misnomer. Uh, the work that was just the colored squares is not called abstract. It's called non-representational or non-objective, meaning it doesn't represent anything. It strictly deals with formal lines and shapes and colors. Um, note takers, if you can see enough light to do this, I'm going to give you three real general style categories that are helpful in, in accessing a work of art because many times you walk in and it's just like, oh, what do, what do I look at? What do I think about? And one thing you can think about is what style the artist has used. Um, the style that the Thomas Cole, the first one we saw, is what we call representational, also sometimes called realism. That simply means that the artist has attempted to capture the natural appearance of something. Second style, as I mentioned, is abstract art. Um, now, abstract art, though, is still based on reality. If you think of Picasso's cubistic, crazy women that you can see the side of their head and the back of it and the front all at the same time, those are abstractions, but you can still see that they're based on nature. They still look like a woman, not a lot, but <laughs> abstract art does have a reference to the real world. So don't make the mistake of calling something that is a blob of color abstract. It's not. It's what we call non-representational or non-objective thing. No object, not real. <laughs> no phonetic, but no, there is something. Okay. Um, all right, number four, please. Oh, that's number four. All right. Um, you probably thought this was a comic strip. Maybe not. You guys have all been around enough. If you're here tonight, that's a pretty good indication that you are interested in art. But this is a work of art, a painting by the artist Roy Lichtenstein, who was a pop artist of the 1960s. Along with Andy Warhol, Clive Oldenburg, and other artists, they satirized popular culture borrowed themes such as comic strips, advertisements, and everyday objects from ordinary life. 
The whole point of this kind of art, because I don't really like it, in fact, I find it irritating. Um, <coughs> their work, though, holds a mirror up to us. They hold our culture up in front of us and put it in our face. Uh, they make us take a closer look at what we surround ourselves with every day. So it may not be pretty, and I'm sure you don't want to hang it over the couch, but it does make a social statement. Slide five, please. Bonnie, what year was that? Uh, let's see, that was 60, um, let's see. I knew I'd put my list here. I would say that's like 63. I need to pull, I have my list of the actual works on the earlier page. Um, okay, yeah. Um, all right, moving right along here. <laughs> this is one of my favorite pieces that I'm showing you tonight. Um, I'm sure some of you were at least fooled by Marilyn Levine's ceramic sculpture called HRH Briefcase, done in 1985. Uh, you know, until relatively recently, ceramic artists focused on the functional. It wasn't until this century that they got the idea of taking clay and making other things out of it besides things that could be used. Um, of course, now artists feel free to make absolutely anything, even briefcases. Um, Levine is renowned for her ability to manipulate clay into replicating other surfaces. Leather is especially one of her excellent ones, but she's been known to do ball bags, backpacks, shoes. Um, but don't be misled. Uh, the most important thing about Levine's work goes beyond her technical skill. That's just one part of it. Um, she uses her work as pieces to describe people by the objects they leave behind them such as shoes, handbags, briefcases. This briefcase is a biographical piece about someone with the initials HRH who <coughs> left it behind. So she's not just trying to show off, oh, look what I can do with clay. Here's what I want you to keep in mind. You know, many laymen often if, if, if equate good art with good technical skill. You know, if something's beautiful, a mirror, exact replica of the world, oh, that's good art. But uh, you know, you feel so much more comfortable with things that you know. But here's what I want you to keep in mind. The idea behind the technique is where the art is at. Okay? It's the idea or concept behind the art and technique that makes it great art. Remember this. I don't know who told me this one time, but I thought it's a great quote. Technique is only a means to an end but it is not an end in itself. So when some kid at the high school copies a painting absolutely perfectly, oh, what a great artist you are. No, oh, what a great technician you are. Do you have something to say with your technique? Then you are an artist. And I think that's so important to understand. Now I'm gonna be showing you some things that don't really have any technique. <laughs> And so I have a little trouble. I think there would be a little technique going with the idea, too. But we're going to look at some of these art forms and perhaps see some validity to these pieces that perhaps lack technique. All right, let's see. Now, the slide, please. The next few works, I'm sure, were a bit misleading. You probably don't ordinarily think of wrapped coastlines, stuffed goats, or performances <coughs> as art. Um, this is Christo. He's considered a very unique environmental artist. Um, he has created probably the largest works of this kind of, of any artist in existence. Um, as a young man, he immigrated to America after escaping from Bulgaria with only the clothes on his back. And um, while he was traveling and journeying, he had so few possessions, and I'm not exactly sure where the idea of wrapping something came in, um, but it was directly related to his um, sparse lifestyle that he led for a while. But, uh, as I mentioned, he's very famous for his temporary transformations by wrapping or covering everything from buildings to islands. Uh, his massive projects require years of planning. He uses the traditional method, however, of artistic collaboration, only he does it with hundreds of people. Uh, he usually creates drawings and designs for each project, which he sells, to help fund that and subsequent projects. Um, he's done a lot of interesting pieces. Uh, and I, I have to be honest and say I never really understood why in the heck you would put the millions of dollars it takes to do a Cristo running fence, for example, a piece he did in Northern California. He did a 38-mile-long nylon fence uh, that was, I think, 12 feet tall. Um, it took 
years and years to organize it. Uh, hundreds of ranchers had to agree, agree to let him cross his land. I mean, there were so many obstacles you can't believe. But it ran across, out across the, the wine uh, vineyards of Northern California and ended right in the Pacific Ocean. And if you've ever seen a photograph of it, it is an awesome thing to see. Um, in 1983, he completed a piece called Surrounded Islands, where he took 11 islands in Biscayne Bay, Florida, and surrounded them with skirts of pink polypropylene fabric. Um, as I mentioned, it was completed in May of 1883, after years of planning, involved 430 workers who helped to clean the area, um, and then with the enormous task of moving, unfurling, lacing this floating fabric. Now, it existed only two weeks, but millions of viewers came to see this, whether it be out of artistic interest or just curiosity, they came. Um, his display helped them to see the islands briefly in a new context. The other thing that Christo does, though, is he always leaves a place better than he finds it. That was a very polluted area until he came there, and after he left, it changed the ecology permanently clean the whole place up. Uh, Christo loves his art and he loves the process. He absolutely loves, believe it or not, the hundreds of miles of red tape he has to go through to get approval for this. I mean, you can imagine what it took. He, he wrapped the Reichstag government building in Berlin, Germany. That's his most recent project that he did. Started in 1971 and he finished it last year. Um, can you imagine what he had to go through to do this? Completely encircled the outside. I don't have a slide of it, but I do have a brochure in my bag that I'm going to drag out and show you later. Um, anyway, his wife, Jean-Claude, is his collaborator, and she helps him. Christo doesn't like to speak English if he doesn't have to. I mean, he's totally fluent, but he likes to make Jean-Claude do all that. So, anyway, he's a man. What can you say? Um, <laughs> when they started this, though, in 1971, they saw it as a symbol of the relationship between the Eastern Bloc and the West. But today, they see it as a symbol of the end of the Cold War. So, kind of an interesting piece. Slide, please. <laughs> this is probably the wildest. <laughs> well, maybe not. Maybe the second wildest piece I'm going to show you. This is called Coyote. I like America, and America likes me. <laughs> and this was a performance piece done in 1974 by Joseph Boys, a German called Process Artist. Um, process artists believe that art is experienced primarily in the act of producing or creating. And they believe that the ideas behind and the creation of are more important than the medium or the form. Now, Boys was a real controversial figure. He's dead now. but. Um, his art form sometimes included, as I said, performance art. Now that belongs to the history of theater. Um, in performance or visual art, though, the artist's intention is to assert his presence by becoming a living work of art. Life for boys was a creative process, and he felt everyone was an artist to an extent. Now I find this really interesting. He assumed the guise of a modern-day shaman intent on healing the spiritual crisis of contemporary life that he felt was caused by the rift between arts and sciences. And he was trying to find a common denominator between these polarities, and so he created objects and scenarios uh, which, although rather baffling at face value, um, were meant to be understood through intuition. Um, boys created art oftentimes out of commonplace objects, but they were always entailed, there was always a complex symbolism that sprang from his own personal experience. One work that I don't have a slide of called Rescue Sled, done in 1969. <coughs> uh, picture this, it's just a, a little wooden sled, and very neatly strapped to it is a blanket, a flashlight, some wax, and a rope. And it referred to his rescue by nomadic Tartars after his plane was shot down in World War II. Um, this work that you're looking at right now, um, in 1974, boys spent one week caged up in a New York gallery with a coyote, uh, an animal sacred to Native Americans but persecuted by the white man. His objective in this dialogue, in quotes, was to lift the trauma caused to an entire nation by the schism between two opposing worldviews. So there, there truly was a healing meant to happen in doing this. When I first saw it, I thought it was the goofiest daggone thing I ever saw. I mean, look at this guy sitting under a blanket with an umbrella or something. I mean, I just thought, what is this? But in reading the symbolism behind it, um, it's really a very moving piece. Okay, next slide, please. <laughs> this is what I love. This is 
a relief sculpture, an assemblage called Essex by an artist named John Chamberlain, done in 1960, called an assemblage sculpture. And as I mentioned earlier, the title refers to a makeup car that hasn't been on the market for a couple of years, uh, suggesting that this homage, this object, is a kind of homage to vanished species. Now, as I mentioned, we don't know if any of these pieces really were ever in Essex, but we can also see, without very much careful looking, how much detail was a paid, uh, uh, how much attention to detail was paid to the formal, we call formal aspects. When I use the word formal, I'm referring to the use of lines and shapes and colors and textures, value and space. The way the artist very deliberately manipulates what you see within the compositional view. Formal, that's, that's what that means. Um, is he really? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. This is Carolyn Weston, who's quite an art historian. He's a Rochester Well, I didn't know that. That's very exciting. Um, anyway, at this artist's hand, I think the junk, the, the total of the junk, is certainly much greater than the sum of its parts, don't you think? Slide, please. How large is it? It is about four feet by six feet. Next slide, please. <coughs> Okay, this is called Homage to the Square Ascending by Joseph Albers. Then in 1953, my flashlight just died, so I'm going to do it a little bit. Let's see here. Um, he was an intellectual artist involved in exploring the relationship of colors. Uh, Albers, is, Albers isn't attempting to express emotion. He's not trying to clean up the environment. He's not trying to make a social statement about anything. He's exploring color, plain and simple. Um, like many other 20th century artists, he chose to explore strictly formal concerns. From the 1950s to the 1960s, he made hundreds of paintings that had nests of three and four squares on the canvas, and that was all, perfectly square canvases. Um, in each painting, though, the colors vary. Albers hoped to show that the dynamic interaction of colors and how they work together when placed side by side. How some colors uh, advance, some recede, how the color intensify or de-intensify each other. And he thought by restricting himself to the square, he would avoid distractions of form so that the viewer can concentrate totally on pure saturated color. So he is channeling your total consciousness exactly the place he wants it to be, which is on the color interactions. Um, and the other kind of interesting thing, I think, because it's a series, Homage to the Square makes the point that there's no one best way that a painting can be done, but many different possibilities, which is also what 20th century, if we wanted to make a summary about 20th century art, that would have to be one probably too. Slide please. Our last slide, which is called Monogram, I'm going to have to go back right now, a little bit more light because it's too dark. This is called Monogram with Ram. <laughs> I saw it in another book, and it was just called Monogram. So it depends on what, me, what book you look in um, as to what title they will give you. Um, here. Oh, this is, was done from 1955 to 1959. It's a construction, or called a freestanding combine. Now, to understand how Rauschenberg worked, you have to understand that art of the 20th century has focused on redefining what is art. Uh, pushing it into every new direction, every medium possible, and uh, many of the new art forms grew and evolved as a reaction to or against other art movements. Um, now, until World War II, the center of the art world was in Europe, and it had been since the dawn of time. But in 1933, when Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany, uh, it's estimated that 60,000 writers, artists, musicians, architects, and actors began an exodus from Europe. And many of them fled westward to the U.S., namely to New York City, bringing with them their creative ideas and theories about art. Um, they brought with us such movements as expressionism, surrealism, dada, and just abstraction in all different forms. <coughs> well, there was a young man from Wyoming named Jackson Pollock who moved to New York just about that time. And he was interested, or he interacted with many creative artists who held many ideas about art and abstraction. And so from these contacts and over the years, I mean, he was a WPA mural painter. He painted some of the old post office murals. So, I mean, it wasn't that he's some guy that spilled some paint one day and accidentally invented a movement. Um, it took many years of interacting with these creative artists to come up with what was considered the first truly American art movement, which Pollock in invented, called Abstract Expressionism. Slide, please, Georgia. Um, also called action painting. 
also called action painting, Pollock brought together paint, action, and canvas in a totally personal <laughs> and original way. This canvas um, is approximately 15 feet long. So you get a feel, I mean, it's so ludicrous to look at this little bitty thing up there on the screen. The real thing is uh, completely different. Um, Anyway, he would lay large expanses of can unprimed canvas on his studio floor, and then he would move across the canvas, dripping, splattering, and swirling color from his brush. Sometimes he'd take a can, slosh it out across the canvas, or he'd climb up a ladder and do a rhythmic series of splatters across the painting. But he deliberately abandoned control of his paint in the conventional sense. However, he would then go back in when the painting was dry. He would crop out the area that he felt was most visually exciting. He would often paint back into it um, until he got the arrangement that he was seeking. So it wasn't total accident. But the style of abstract expressionism and non-objective styles of the 1950s prevailed for over a decade in the US. So back to Rauschenberg and the stuff go. Um, slide, please. Rauschenberg reacting to and against the lack of figuration in Pollock's abstract expressionism. And there were, oh, a whole host of artists. He, the color field painters who would just do big blurs of color on the canvas. Oh, Morris Lewis would pour different colors and let it drip down the canvas. Well, Pollock was tired of that. And so uh, he decided to uh, react against these non-objective trends in the 1950s and turn to an art of ideas. And he studied such issues as reality versus unreality, meaning versus context, specific versus the universal. Rauschenberg, inspired by earlier artists who used common everyday objects in their art, Joseph Boyce for one, decided to create a new art form, three-dimensional collage, or what's called a combine. He would blend the banal and sensational images derived from magazines and newspapers. He'd use silkscreen. Anyway, Rauschenberg the work, I think, is difficult to interpret at best, but it is serious intellectual art, and that, that's what I want to impress upon you. He is very, very serious about this stuff for him. So, let me wrap this up very quickly. Okay, what can we conclude? Do you want to hit the light and then I can just speak from here? What can we conclude? May I ask a question about You sure may. What is the ram on? Is that it's on a it? platform. This includes an actual stout ram. There's a tire. There are some signs. There's painting on it. And this is a piece that can be hung on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> it's a wall piece if you want it to be. So, um, But it, it's not an accessible piece unless you have extensive information about what the concerns were he was dealing there. It's not one that your average person can go up and really enjoy. So let's, let's wrap this up here. What can we conclude from the works that we've seen and maybe conclude in general about the art of the 20th century? Number one, it takes many different forms. Number two, artists of the 20th century have made it their mission to push art as far as they possibly can. Uh, they are constantly looking for new ways to respond to and against and with their world. <coughs> Uh, some art is more difficult to understand than others, but if you know a little something about the artist's intention, about what it is they're trying to accomplish, it makes such a difference in your ability to appreciate and enjoy it. So here's my advice to you. What if there is no information there and you're confronted with a work of art? Here's what I suggest you do. Number one, look very long and very hard, studying it very, very closely. Allow yourself to respond to the work. Examine how it affects you. Look closely at the lines and shapes and colors, the placement of them. Try to speculate. What is this artist doing? Are they recording their world? Are they showing us the intangible, perhaps just their creative vision? Try to figure out what is the function of it. Um, now, appreciating art doesn't mean taking it home and hanging it over your couch. You don't have to do that to engage in a work of art. But it does require looking, examining, and thinking about what you see about respecting that an artist is presenting their viewpoint. Um, and I guess what I want to preach the, the, <laughs> the preacher's message is, uh, good art, great art, bad art, is it for you? That, that's totally your decision. But good, bad, or ugly, um, it's a way to broaden your experience, to live your life more fully, and enhance your life. Thank you very much. so enjoyable and Bob for all the help that he did also in um, making everything so easy, outstanding, hospitality all around. So it's good to be here and it's good to see so many people here. Um,
For me, it's rather nice to be able to have um, a retrospective exhibition. I show my work quite a lot, but I usually just manage to show my most recent works. So to have work displayed in, in one gallery from all different eras of my career is interesting for me, uh, and I hope it is for you. And it's nice for me to see um, different periods of my work and to try and figure out kind of where I've been and where I'm at and where I'm going and to see it in one room sort of clarify some issues for me. Um, one thing that comes to mind right away is that there are certain themes that apparently interest me um, that recur and usually this is to do with certain kinds of subject matter and it seems to keep cropping up in different forms and is manipulated in different ways. But obviously, um, I've been interested in the same kinds of, of uh, subject matter right from early on when I started painting. Now, those themes involve, I think, color for one thing, and that's obviously become more important to me as the years have gone by. Um, Lacy subjects, lace and fabric, chiffon, translucencies, seeing through layers of things to see beyond, seeing through um, transparent glass, fabric, whatever, to get more complicated images emerging has, um, has been more and more important focus for me as, as time goes on. But I see it in my early works. Um, now, as a child, I grew up in Surrey, in England. And I think a lot of my influences come from very early on. Uh, it's particularly the lacy fabrics, which my mum loved. She had little lacy doilies all over the place and lace curtains at the window. She always had a vase of fresh flowers in the window. And her garden was just beautiful always very, very colourful. She dressed me in bright coloured dresses and you know, <laughs> all this stuff. And I just think that probably um, relates somehow to my interests, the way my interests have developed over the time. Um, I went to college in Wales and um, there, I had always, I'd for a long time been interested in fabrics. I'd done a lot of dressmaking and um, uh, just really like manipulating fabrics. And when I was in college, my main interest was making fabric collages, making pictures out of layers of different kinds of fabric. I liked the textures, and I liked the <coughs> translucencies of nets and chiffons, and, um, or, well, just all kinds of different colored fabrics, and I would make pictures with the fabrics themselves. I was also at this time getting into oil painting, but it was, it's interesting looking back that um, my early interest in college with the overlayment of fabrics is now translated for me into oil paint. I'm doing similar kinds of things in, in some regard, but now I'm using oil paint uh, instead, of, instead of the actual fabrics. Uh, I always, have loved uh, natural objects. I just always had a, a natural sort of love of, of um, flowers, shells, bits of bone, twigs, anything that kind of catches my eye. And I think part of this was uh, particularly the seashells. I've always loved seashells. And um, my parents always took me on a summer vacation to the uh, to the south coast of England, and I collect shells every year. <laughs> and I still collect shells. <laughs> um, so, some of the earlier paintings that you see represented in this exhibition, you will see some of these things. In this painting, for example, called Maritime Rose, um, which was 1980, so quite a long time ago. Uh, I used two shells and a rose, and I chose these objects to put together because I saw similarities. When I looked at this shell here uh, on the right, it looked 
rose-like to me. And so I chose to put a rose with it to enhance the similarities that I saw between the two objects. And you probably have noticed that I have a natural um, kind of tendency to blow things up kind of big. <laughs> I just always see things that way. And um, my sketchbook would always be full of little tiny shell drawings, but I always enlarge them, and then by the time they got onto a canvas, they got real big. <laughs> now this painting is a similar kind of thing. Um, again, it's a shell, but this time I'm manipulating it with layers of chiffon and lace. So I'm seeing patterns in the shell that are reminding me of lace fabric. And so I choose to put the shell with some lace and pull, pull the two things together and also, you know, um, say something about man-made fabric, fabrics can have a similarity to natural forms also. So um, this earlier work, the theme was in general combining different objects that I thought would enhance each other's um, beauty. I'm going to head over to that corner of the room now. So my, the focus of my paintings has been, as I've already mentioned over there, to work mostly with organic kind of subject matter, flowers, shells, bones, uh, lacy man-made fabrics, and um, to manipulate them into interesting compositions. In 1980, my work took a uh, a change, a dramatic change, and it was for very personal reasons that this change just took place. Um, in that year, my mother died, which was a shock. It, you know, she wasn't very old, but she was in pretty good health, and it just sort of uh, took the wind out of my sails, to say the least. And um, it started to make me think about what I was painting, and it I wanted to paint something in particular to ease the pain of losing my mom. I wanted to do something for her. I wanted to eternalize her memory. I'm sure we've all experienced a similar kind of emotion. And I painted this painting um, soon after her death. And this painting is very symbolic. It has a lot of uh, items in it which are very meaningful to me in, in different ways. The flowers at the back of the painting are flowers that were on her grave and each of the flower arrangements um, symbolizes a different member of my family, like the roses were the roses that my dad put down for her and the lilies were were from me, and uh, fuchsias from my brother, etc. The whole family's up there. <laughs> They've all got a flower. <laughs> and the, the silk chiffon scarf was the scarf I wore to the funeral. And um, the lace hanky, of course, was just kind of speaks for itself. And the leaf just sort of crept in there. I didn't even think about the importance of having a leaf descending back into the earth until my father wrote a poem. I had this painting hanging in an exhibition in Lafayette and um, my father was visiting and he was very moved by this painting and he wrote a poem about it. And of course, um, he captured the meaning of the painting better than I had when I painted it. So it, it was a really very very emotional experience, so paintings sometimes take that bend. And then 18 months later, my father died, and I painted this painting here um, after that. Again, of course, just very sad time. This is the church where both my parents are buried, and um, the flowers that were on the grave again. And I symbolize the closing of an era of my parents both dying. Um, by putting these lacy curtains, which were the curtains from their home. Of course, they were white, really, and I changed them to black curtains that were, were drawing in at a close. Uh, and from that point on, um, I, I was in England for a year after that, and having to go through 
the sadness involved with going through all the possessions and whatnot. And going through all the family photographs, all those photos that my dad had taken on our family holidays down at the seaside. And I started doing a series of work um, using the figures, which was usually just us family, um, my mum and dad and my brother and, and I. Uh, and I'd take the figures out of, uh, of the photograph. I'd use the figure, I'd use the pose, but I'd put them in a different context. And this is one example. It's probably not the strongest example, but it happens to be the closest one right now. <laughs> there are some on the other side of the room where we just came from. This is my mom. It's a very romantic pose. Um, and the flower is a peony, the petals dropping from the flower, heart-shaped. I'm in a very, you know, this is a very emotional kind of state of affairs that I'm, I'm painting about. Um, on the other side of the room, I won't drag you back there right now, but there were some paintings from the same series of work that I painted in this period of 19, 1981 to 82. One is of me when I was a little kid um, collecting seashells on the seashore. Um, again, you'll notice, uh, notice that I like to magnify images quite considerably, and the, the shells are taken on a greater importance than human beings. They're sort of larger than life. Um, and, and another one back there it includes my dad in his recent years looking back. It's called Dad's Reminiscences. He's looking back over the years um, as, he, as he remembers my brother and myself when we were little children and my mom when she was younger. So um, this period of time was very very helpful to me in an emotional sense. My, I was using my painting to help me out. Um, and after that, um, I went through some changes also. And I did um, some paintings that are on the back of that screen over there. I don't know if we can move around again <coughs> right now. Maybe you can just take a look in a, in a moment when we set up again. Um, there are three paintings of an interior. I moved home and I started a sort of new life. I got remarried and whatnot, you know, everything's going on here. And um, they're very different pieces of work again. And yet I still see similarities. That the themes of light and reflections are um, amazingly, in some ways, uh, present in these in these newer newer paintings, they include artificial lights. They're interior scenes of our home. Um, they they use artificial lights, which are reflecting images on glass objects on the walls. And um, very unintentional, but this theme of light and glass and reflections just keep um, recurring. You know? <coughs> and I. I it, you know, it, it, it takes a show like this almost for me to look for things like that and to realize, you know, what's going on. Well, after, um, after that sort of stage of my life, I, I started, I moved out to the country actually and started studying flowers a lot more. Flowers had always interested me a great deal. But as I was studying and observing flowers, um, I became very aware of the natural quality of sunlight filtering through leaves um, onto flowers, leaves, and organic shapes. And I, I did a lot of work with that. Um, until this period of time, in fact, I had sketchbooks that were full of drawings and studies and um, ideas and I would put these ideas together from my sketchbook when I wanted to figure out a composition. And my work changed at this point of time and I started using photographs. And I would just try and capture a moment of light effects that didn't last very long. I was more interested in the light now than I was in the objects themselves. And I was more interested in trying to portray 
the way we really see things. You know, we seldom see a single rose in the garden uh, unless it's got shadows over it and is entangled up with uh, some other kinds of plants and flowers. And so my new focus was to try and capture the light effects and the effects of movement in the garden and, and wherever, the greenhouse, I visit botanical gardens where, whenever I get a chance for, um, for my inspiration, if that's what you want to call it. Um, so for several years, and I don't have um, a lot of examples of that period of my work, there's one over there called Corinthia Canopy, which is actually looking through beech leaves looking up at the sky through beech leaves, where I became interested in the overlapping shapes of the leaves, where they made new shapes and new colors. Um, and after this stage of, of my work, um, and I, I painted in this theme for several years and uh, explored a lot of different avenues, and I came to the point where I wanted to I wanted to try something different, and I wanted to, it sounds kind of crazy, but people had looked at some of my flower paintings and said, oh, that's, that's, so, that's so pretty, you can almost smell it. And I thought, this is, this is what I want. This is really what I want. I want to be able to paint smell, which was a really bizarre idea. <laughs> and it didn't really work, but <laughs> it got me off on a new track, and that was important. Because when I had this silly thought, I, I went into my bedroom and I had all these little perfume bottles with different colored perfumes in them. And I brought them out into my studio and I put them um, on the surface where the light would come through them in the late afternoon. And I just got so excited when I saw all the patterns that the refractions made. The light came through the bottles and then there were all these colored shadows and the water would make, you know, the colored water would just sort of dance over the flat surface that these bottles were sitting in. So this was um, the way I got interested in glass. Uh, so, you know, that smell idea was good for something. <laughs> <laughs> and so maybe we should move now uh, to a different slot where we can look at some glass, paintings of glass, um, <coughs> where I can maybe describe a little bit about what I... Okay, um, as I was saying, I've got interesting glass objects, and this open totally new avenues to explore. One of them um, was looking through objects and seeing other objects behind them and seeing what kind of distortions took place. This painting is an example of that. I had a purple plate, behind it was a turquoise bowl and some marbles scattered, scattered around. And I enjoyed seeing the way the marbles became elongated, as you're seeing through the curve of the plate. And the painting seemed to invite me in to the, into another space beyond the initial surface. So this was one aspect that um, I enjoyed about the glass, the transparency, the looking through, the distortions. Another one is um, over here. This is uh, called Reflections in a Crystal Wind. This is really some beautiful crystal that I borrowed. <laughs> I do a lot of borrowing <laughs> glass. <laughs> um, and I was playing around with mirrors. I enjoy using mirrors a lot in my compositions because by manipulating the mirrors, you can, you can really um, make the composition do whatever you want it to do. And here it becomes almost um, <coughs> ambiguous as to what's going on. In fact, a lot of people don't know which way to hang that painting. <laughs> I know people have been tempted to hang it upside down, <laughs> but I won't let them get away with it. Um, so that particular piece, I was interested in the reflective qualities of, of glass rather than the transparency and the, um, 
and the uh, distortions. This is more involved in the etched quality of the glass and, and the reflections and sparkly quality. Another painting that does um, involve the distortions that I was mentioning is, is the piece on the wall back there. This was a tall crystal vase and it had a convoluted <coughs> shape to it. And I got some roses. I had this image in my mind of what I wanted to do with this, this painting. I just, somebody loaned me this vase and I was just ecstatic about it. But I just knew that I wanted to get certain colored roses. And of course, this is in the middle of the winter that I get this particular idea. <coughs> so I couldn't find them for the longest time. And then when I did find roses, the sun wouldn't cooperate. And I always use sunlight for my source of light. But at any rate, Eventually, it all came together, and I pushed the rose blossoms down inside the vase, and so I got distorted shapes, which became all very organic um, and almost human forms coming out of the colours of the roses that are being dis and the shapes that are being distorted by the convolutions of the vase. And then I had the yellow rose on the outside of the vase, which was reflecting its color onto the surface of the vase. So there's several different ideas um, going on there with, with different kinds of um, uh, the qualities that glass has. Glass is just incredibly fascinating. It has so many different kinds of uh, qualities that, that, that you can play around with. A lot of my paintings, as I say, I, I <laughs> I've also become kind of a collector of glass. I, I go to flea markets and <coughs> second-hand stores and pick up any pieces of glass that fascinate me. And um, I really rather enjoy making a painting, making something beautiful, trinket, you know, little dishes for candy or whatnot. And they're just molded things with a pattern in them. And I put this colored food liquid food colouring in there, and, and it just comes alive and, um, you know, makes all these wonderful patterns just out of a cheap little trinket that most of us have sitting around the home. And I, I enjoy to be able to do that and to sort of, I hope that people that see my work look at their little trinket dishes and whatnot with, with new eyes when they go home. <laughs> This is a piece here that's called Arlene's Basket, and that was um, a glass basket that I borrowed from a dear friend. And here you'll see I've introduced the chiffon fabric again that um, keeps sort of popping up, recurring every once in a while. Um, there's some other paintings um, with, again, this, this painting here has a, a very, very cheap little candy dish in it. But it, placed with different colored objects around <coughs> it, it bounced all these wonderful colors um, onto the glass surface. And, and it was just, becomes very fascinating to me. And I just enjoyed, again, as I say, making something beautiful out of something. Well, that's a fairly flower, really. <laughs> Sometimes I really manipulate the images. Now this one, for example, I was trying to, again, create a feeling of the glass being translucent. You can see through layers and layers that will take you back into it. And to do this, this is now um, verging on the abstract, I guess, it could, because I'm more interested in the actual idea of seeing through layers of glass than I am in... Um, representing the pieces accurately as we know them. So this piece is an actual overlayment of different images to produce, as I say, to exaggerate the translucent quality of the glass. Um, I guess I'll say a little bit about the gift of time painting, which um, is in the center here. This was a painting that I did um, for the Morton Community Centre in, in West Lafayette, it was a commission. And um, as a commission, and it's a place where I teach. I teach there one evening a week. And it's a very, very friendly place, and I enjoy teaching there, and I feel part of that community when I'm there. 
And so I wanted to do something special for them. And I chose objects to combine together, which were somewhat symbolic of um, a certain theme. And I had been reading through my dad's poems, and he wrote um, a poem called The Gift of Time. And I thought, this is a very appropriate theme for a community center where folk go to spend some quality time, some leisure time to relax and enjoy, explore new avenues, and to be creative in different ways. And so I chose objects that were meaningful to me in that regard um, as a sort of ongoing um, item in our life. I used a silver bowl, which was my mom's, and um, a lacy shawl, which is what it's sitting on and is behind it. It was a lacy shawl that a, a very elderly lady gave me, and she didn't know me, but she'd seen my paintings and she knew I liked lace. And bless her heart, she gave me this gorgeous shawl, and I wanted to sort of commemorate that beautiful act of her generosity into, into the whole project. I put flowers in the dish because I like flowers <laughs> and I like to paint flowers. But flowers also talk a lot about time. They're, they're here for a short period of time and then they die and then they come back next year uh, and repeat the cycle. And I like the feeling of the cycle and the same way with the timer. Um, it's like make the most of every moment. Life's not that long, you know, just <coughs> time's important, let's not waste a minute. And so that was the idea behind that painting. Um, I think I have about run out of things I want to say, but I did, would like to open it up for any questions you might have. I, I would talk about technique if anybody's interested in that aspect of my work. But um, does anybody have any questions? I have a question. Yeah. In the back, that picture. Uh huh. We were here the other day, and we were all trying to guess what it was, what it was supposed to be. <laughs> anybody have any good guesses? I always enjoy to hear other people's <laughs> ideas. No. Nope. We thought it was like prisons, like coming out of prison or something. Yeah. See, so you were right on. It's actually just a flat surface, but I had. Um, a crystal wedding bowl sitting behind um, where you're actually seeing the image. So I had a bowl sitting up here, and then I had a cobalt blue vase over here, and uh, let's see, another blue vase over here. Now when the sunlight came through from behind, it made all those patterns just on the flat surface that they were sitting on. And that was what was so inspiring to me. Was it a, a varnish table or a mirror? Or it was a white surface. A white surface? And it does that. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. <laughs> yeah. It's, it was a different sort of painting for me. I tend not to use browns a whole lot. By the time that one was done, it was like... <laughs> You were just amazed how it's so abstract and yeah. like just but it's real. That's representationalism. <laughs> 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 That's <laughs> you go home and like, you'll find one. <laughs> Did you say that about the technique you didn't want to use, uh, tell us about it? No, I said I'd be happy to talk about any techniques. Oh, I didn't know if uh, anybody was On the lace is what's so interesting. Uh -huh. What technique did you use on that? I used a little tiny brush <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of time. <laughs> and I nearly went crazy. <laughs> really, actually, I don't have any sort of tricks. I use, they're all oil paintings, I use a medium which is Damar varnish and linseed oil and turpentine, which is a fairly routine sort of medium. And I use uh, sable brushes to yeah, blend the, the colors together yeah. and little tiny brushes yeah, to do lace. To <laughs> I wish there was an easy way. But <laughs> Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. Particularly with this recent work, um, I'm trying really to capture a moment of light and it changes so quickly. 
that I use photos um, and I rely on them actually to magnify images for me now too. You know, I zero in on a little tiny scale. I use a macro lens and I project the image onto the canvas and then work from a print. Do you a lot of the excuse me, a lot of the composition actually I'm doing now with the camera. I'll do some more, you know, when I get the results back, but I do a lot of the composing and a lot of the colour work with the camera. It's like use it's like the sketchbook now. Mm-hmm. Yes, I do all the, all that kind of stuff. Also. Yeah. <laughs> well, I yeah. Tell me how you, I don't know anything about oil painting. Mm -hmm. How would you use the What is what it for? Um, well, for the first layer of paint, okay, I get the image onto the canvas with pencil. And then I cover the canvas with a thin layer of paint using the colors that I think are going to be in those appropriate areas. And then, and, and I just use turpentine to thin the paint at that time. When the canvas is dry, and it dries quickly because I have only used turpentine, then I'll start working into it again, this time thinning the paint with the medium. And it makes the paint very smooth, it makes it, it gives it a little bit of shine, and it makes the colors richer. It just goes on nicer, and um, uh, and basically, you know, that's why I use the medium. And then I keep building up layers of paint. Hillary, do you use liquid? No, actually, I don't like liquid. It's rather thick. I mean, it's the same stuff, but I like it to be thinner than that. <coughs> I know a lot of people do like it. Yeah, usually it's not a problem for me because they, you know, the canvas is fairly large and it takes me a long time to work on one area and by the time I've got to go back into that area, it's dry because I've had the rest of it. She uses the same medium that I do, so obviously there's something in her arm. <laughs> <laughs> About 12. <laughs> I'm kind of obsessed with it. You've gotten away from your remodeling and repurposing homes now. Yes, yeah, I think we're done. Yeah, she said, yeah, she was scared to death. I was going to have a show. Don't be opening like next week or something? Yes, on the 27th. Is that next week? Yeah, in Madison. I mean, to have that many paintings that you can have two complete shows like this. And you told me you sell about how many paintings a year? Did you sell? I usually sell about 25 <laughs> to 30 in that range, and it's about as many as I paint. So the turnovers. If you want to let people look and maybe ask one or one sure. questions, and yeah. if you want to get a print, if anybody's interested in getting a print, we can have one sign it for you. Shall we?